Hello and welcome to today's webinar on engines. My name is Dion Knowles and I'm the marketing manager at Tech Equipment and I am joined today by Digital Dave um, and I'm also joined today by our guest and our guest is Oliver Shaw. Dave and Oliver, are you there from your home offices? We are here. Good afternoon, Oliver. Good afternoon, Dion. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Great to see you online with us today. Have you got really bad weather? Because it is tipping it down here with me. It isn't no. good. <laughs> it isn't good. It's pretty hot here. <laughs> I've, had to, I've had to come indoors to shelter from the from the sun a little bit this morning. It's really hot here. Don't isn't tell it? me that, Dave. I'm agreeing no, with it's not. <laughs> it's not. It's wretched. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to say, I'm pleased to hear that, just because I want to feel this unity in misery. <laughs> uh, wait, yeah. you, know, you, know, you know the term steroids, but we've got it here, Dion. Right, okay, fair enough. Fair enough, we're, we're in this miserable day together. But it's not miserable here at our webinar because we are gonna be talking about something that you are both really passionate about. And you could tell that in yesterday's Q&A live as we were talking about electric cars in the motorsport industry. Uh, we <laughs> yeah. are talking about engines. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we yeah. might even get to come back to dis debate the electric engine once more today. Yeah. Well, there's no debate, Dion. Oliver and I are united on this. There is no debate. Well, that's so, true. I think... I say think that, as soon as it was obvious today, I had a barrage <laughs> of emails saying, I will convert you to electric yeah. motorsport. Brilliant. Just yeah. sped in. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, well, I just want to remind everybody who's joining us live, this is a live webinar. So this is your opportunity to ask your questions as we're going through this. Don't feel that you need to wait till the end. Just pop your questions in the chat box. I'm monitoring those constantly and we'll pass those over to Oliver and Dave. Do let us know in the chat box where you are in the world and what the weather is today. Are you enjoying, enjoying blazing sunshine? Is it hard for you to concentrate in your home offices? Or are you hunkering down in the corner of your room with a fire on as there's a storm raging outside? Do let us know in the chat box. Right, let's start with telling you a bit more about tech equipment. Some people don't know much about it, but many of you do. So I'll keep it fairly brief. As a company, we design and manufacture educational teaching products all under one roof in Long Eaton. We've got engineers there, we've got production people, we've got planners, we've got it shipped out from there. We do the sales support, customer care support, all under that one roof. Now, right now, we're not all under that one roof. The essential people, the production people, the people who are shipping products are in there um, with all their PPE, following their social distancing rules. And the likes of Dave and myself and many, many others are working from their home offices to support everybody around the world at the moment. As a company, let me tell you a little bit more about us. Uh, we sell all over the world, more than 100 countries in more than 1,200 different organisations. Uh, and that's in industry, that's at universities and colleges all around the world. Um, we have one private owner and we have a vast array of teaching products that cover both engineering and civil engineering teaching disciplines, um, over 450 in total. If you want to know more about our history, we're over 63 years old, so we've been going some time now. You can check that out on our website for the history of how two gentlemen met on a train 63 years ago and began what is tech equipment today. As a company, yes, we make engineering teaching products, but it's about bringing engineering principles, real life understandings, but most importantly, about making students have allowing them to have the skill set that gives them the employable skills that is required for the market today and tomorrow. We're not just about providing products though, we very much feel like we want to be part of the uh, holistic part of the teaching process. So we uh, play a role in bringing together communities around the world of engineering educators in social community groups that we've got on LinkedIn and um, Facebook. And we also play a role in helping engage and really promote uh, the uh, practical teaching with students through student competitions. I'll talk more about these later. 
as a company, again, when we're thinking about creating these products, because that is the core of what we do, we design and manufacture products that you as academics, lecturers, lab technicians use all around the world. We have certain principles of product design in mind. One of those is sparking passion and enthusiasm for students. That's the most important because that allows students to engage with the topic. It really is important for the learning process. It's also, we don't want products that are going to last a couple of years. It's about standing the test of time. We've got pieces of equipment that are still in use that go right back to the 1960s. Um, and we're very, very proud of that. And we offer a five year warranty as standard, uh, but many, many products go years and years beyond that. When we're designing and enhancing products, we also have other aspects in mind. One of those is performance that is faster and more effective because we can't have it faster and compromise on the learning objectives. So it's reducing um, tasks that don't really have a learning um, experience associated with them. We look at how we can get rid of those. How can we use versatile data acquisition to supplement that process? It doesn't always work that you need to use versatile data acquisition. Sometimes you need to get hands on, use dials and gauges and use measurements yourself. Uh, so we're constantly looking at how to strike that right balance. In terms of providing and working with academics, we're all about also about simplifying teaching. So it's matching your syllabus requirements and things are changing at the moment. And we are looking at how can we change as an organization to match your syllabus requirements um, in the short, medium and long term. And we're working closely with academics all around the world on that. To support that, we provide uh, supporting instructional and theoretical material in terms of manuals and videos. Do make the most of those if you are not already doing so. Check out the rest of the videos on the YouTube channel, for example. You didn't really come here to listen to me talk about tech equipment though. You came here to listen to Dave and Oliver get passionate about engines. So at this point, I'm gonna hand over to Dave who can tell us, uh, introduce us to engine, engines and tell us why he really does love the <laughs> All right, Dion. So uh, just looking at that, um, before I start talking about the TQ engines, um, I first got involved and in, in, excited about engines in 1985, and that's a certificate I got from college where I studied engines and chassis. So that goes all the way back, all the way back to 1985 when I started racing minis. But moving on then, Dion. Um, so our engines, our engine range offers uh, teaching equipment for a huge variety of specific, specific theory. Okay covering internal combustion engines, starting with simple four-stroke engines, all the way through to gas turbines and turbojets, okay? Um, this range or our range meets entry-level requirements for general teaching of mechanical engineering, and it addresses more advanced theories uh, later on for final year students. Now this can lead students into aerospace, automotive and power even. So, you know, what every week I sort of define something at the beginning of these presentations. So what is it? What is an engine? We all know the word, but it's a machine that is designed to convert one form of energy into mechanical power. OK, so heat engines like the internal combustion engine, they burn fuel, they create heat and which is then used to do work. All right. So our range on the next slide falls into two categories. Before we go too far on though, Dave, if you want to explain this and then we'll hop over to Oliver to tell us a bit about uh, the skills gap as well. Yeah, so uh, en our engines overview, like I said, it falls into two categories. We have internal combustion engines and we have gas turbines, okay? So before I move on to the products, what is an internal combustion engine? Well, it's an engine that generates motive power okay, by burning petrol or diesel or any other fuel with air inside an engine, okay. Those hot gases produced uh, are used to drive a piston or do other work as they expand, okay, which takes it on to our very popular TD200 on the next slide. Right, well, before we do that, I just want to hop over, Dave, to Oliver, before we get okay. into the nitty gritty, and talk yep. a little bit about um, 
why why we're really focusing on engines today and uh, identify the skills gap that you've seen Oliver and what your experience has been in industry and and why you're focusing on that um, as an educator now. Uh, yes well the skills gap on uh, in the motor vehicle industry right now is, is quite a it's quite a massive skills gap as I alluded to yesterday we've got a problem where um, 20 to 30 years ago uh, <laughs> A motor vehicle mechanic was somebody who uh, worked on a couple of systems under a bonnet, checking uh, distributors, spark plugs, spark plug leads, and you know, making sure there was uh, compression and combustion. And um, to achieve the compression and combustion, which uh, we have today in the most efficient way possible, many more systems have been introduced over the years, and we have gone from what uh, was a handful of systems. Up until up to 200 systems. So if you've got 200 systems on a present day car, and that's just a rough estimate, um, you can't just get somebody who's got a basic understanding of how a car works to diagnose faults with up to 200 systems, especially when them systems are very complex and are often running on closed loop and open loop, not just closed loop system like it was previously. Now you've got lots of sensor inputs that are all controlling very fine injections of fuel multiple times every millisecond. And these systems are very complex. Now the skills gap that there is at the moment is that uh, for some reason in the, the, the motor trade, it seems to be like engineering's poor, poor nephew or poor cousin. And it certainly isn't. Um, a lot of the people who work at uh, Mount Os Repairs in Wigan, which is our public company, you know, they're engineers, uh, engineers that have chose to take motor vehicle of a passion. And that's why we work on all ranges of vehicles, right up until full electric hybrid vehicles um, and the most modern motorsport vehicles. So the skills gap we've got at the moment is that people who are passionate about engineering aren't necessarily going down a motor vehicle route wanting to repair cars which is actually no a systems analyst so that is where the skills gap is we just haven't got that technical training available uh, at a grassroots level as in you know entering college uh, or them type of people wanting to go into that type of training to be able to satisfy the industry demand this is why uh, motor vehicle engineers which are referred them to from uh, from now on because we aren't a motor mechanic anymore you know a motor mechanic was somebody who took a part off put it back on now you've got people analyzing systems and it's getting them people who are in interested in doing that and have a passion for that to want to go into the motor industry and getting them right, right them types of people employed within the motor industry like i said our place at wigan we've got motor vehicle engineers and the salaries they get paid you know are, very high salaries of what you would actually think uh, somebody who works in the motor industry will be getting. So yeah, that is a major problem we've got at the moment. Getting them people who are interested in automotive into that right area to fill the skills gap. I think there's a societal perception thing that we need to address there, isn't there? Yeah, there's certainly. Yeah. Engineers as well. People don't necessarily appreciate what's involved. They don't put the value in it so that young people then don't aspire to be that they might be really interested in tinkering about with the cars or the bikes or whatever, mm. uh, but they don't then connect that to what, what really is an offer for them. Uh, and so we all need to play a role perhaps in being more vocal about that. So really, really appreciate you bringing that to our attention today, Oliver. So now we're gonna hop back over to Dave because he wants to talk more about obviously the engineering teaching products today. And we were going to talk about the internal combustion engines. Oliver, you're there in the background. Do you feel free to jump in um, and mention bits, um, add value as Dave talks through this. There you go, Dave. Okay, so the, the first slide we're looking at now is our very popular TD200. Uh, this is a trolley mounted mobile engine test set with benchtop um, instrumentation. We can investigate um, the fundamental features of an internal combustion engine. Um, the, the, the buyer will require at least one of uh, the engines available, one of the four engines available, which we'll talk about in, in a later slide. This enables a wide investigation 
into the characteristics of four stroke petrol and diesel engines. OK, there are optional accessories available to extend the study even further. But again, I'll, I'll talk about those in a moment. Um, the equipment is quick. It's very convenient. We get accurate engine mounting and changeover. It's robust, uh, uses a water type dynamometer. So there's no need for large electrical, electrical supplies. Um, the instrumentation and the test bed are actually separate to avoid any vibration being transmitted to, to the, 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 the measuring devices. And it works, of course, with our very popular uh, VDAS, our versatile data acquisition system. Um, we have a choice of fuel gauges, either an automatic fuel gauge that measures the fuel consumption grams per second, or it has a simple uh, pipette type fuel gauge, which is the uh, AVF one, and, and, and uh, the user would just use a stopwatch and measure the volume of fuel that's being consumed. Okay, so with this test set, we can look at the speed, we can look at the torque generated, we've got the power generated, we can look at the inlet and exhaust enthalpies, the air fuel ratios, the thermal efficiency, and the volumetric efficiency. So, really, really good introduction. To, to motor vehicle technology. Looks like you've got a bit of a, a video going on there, Dion. Yes, this video was taken at the University of Derby as they've got one. Uh, there. I thought I recognised it. Yeah. A wonderfully big screen there as well. Yeah. Um, that was our, our pretend student at work. Yeah, I was super jealous. That's something like a 70 inch screen they've got there. I'm super jealous, you know. Yeah, it's impressive, isn't it? It's yeah. really cool when they get, actually get the camera inside the flow channel and you can see what's going on on that big screen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so then we can move on to the next product. Which is? Probably the TD300 will be a natural. That's where it's board. taking us, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, it's a little different to the TD200. Uh, this uses a four quadrant drive to start and load the engine. So this gives excellent stability. Uh, it could, we use our engines up to about 10 kilowatts. So again, four stroke diesel and petrol. Uh, the control cabinet has a, a console um, that, 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 gets, that we gather all the data from. Uh, so the motor actually is used to drive the engine or to start the engine. So students can actually establish frictional losses in the, in, the, in the setup. And the control console includes an air box and an office so we can enable students to calculate and measure the airflow. So a little bit more complex than the TD200 there. I think that's quite, if you want more details on how you might compare the TD200 and the TD300, we've got a table in the 2020, you can't actually see it there, the 2020 uh, catalogue that my camera won't let me display, but you, you can look at that <laughs> online as well. Okay. Right, on to the next one, on which would be the different time. engines that we offer to go with these so that you can gain a deeper understanding. Yeah, so we have the TD201, and, uh, sorry, the, oh, yeah, we have the TD2 on one there, TD2 on two. These are modified engines that allow us to introduce a pressure transducer. So we can look at the, uh, the pressure and the volume inside the engine. Then on the left hand side, we have the four stroke diesel and the four stroke petrol. These are modified also um, to, for, the, for the pressure transducer. We also offer electric start for these engines, just to make the starting process a lot easier, especially useful if you've got a diesel engine because they are inherently more difficult to start with a pull core because of the high compression ratio. And then we have some options on the next page. Here we go. Yeah, exhaust calorimeter. This is an interesting piece of kit um, for use with the TD200 and the TD300. It measures the heat content of the exhaust gases and that determines the energy loss to the exhaust um, in energy balance for various types of engines at operating speeds and and loads okay so the main components of that calorimeter are you've got the a gas to water um, shell and tube heat exchanger lots of thermocouples a control valve 
and an instrumentation unit so we can look at we can look at the losses or, or the heat loss to the to the exhaust fantastic and we've got a question now and i think uh, this might be something that both dave and oliver might want to get involved in yeah okrami has said can you explain if we can have these tests virtually for the covid19 situation and Dave, I think that one's really for you, but I think perhaps uh, Oliver might be able to talk about how is you, how they're setting their labs up to overcome some of those challenges. So Dave, yeah. perhaps you could explain first. Well, yeah, to do this, to do it virtually, we would need to be in front of the equipment and we would need to broadcast the data as it happens or, or stored as it, as it, uh, or live, you know? So um, we don't have the facility to do virtual experiments, but we, we we could in the future be in front of a machine, capture the data and, and, and share it. But Oliver, I think is already a little bit further ahead. In yes, yes, some of the equipment, but it's all, uh, well, but we, but we have, which is all tech equipment in our materials labs is, uh, you know, it's, it's using the same uh, type of data capture, capture software as what these pieces of equipment do. Um, we've got what it is, we, but where we've really incorporated it into our learning, and teaching is that in September, with the restrictions that we're going to have on the amount of people that can now be in a room at any one time. Um, so what where, where we've done it is allow some blended learning where we can teach to 40 or 50, as many people as you want to log on at a specific time and have a minimum number of people actually carrying out the practical test live with people watching. And then of course, because then people who are watching can ask questions with a raise your hand function that we're using, um, where we can ask questions throughout the experiment and ask us to either to repeat something or ask us what we're doing. So yeah, we're doing, it's not virtual, but it's blended learning, which is uh, the yeah, best yeah. available at the moment. Oliver, on that, are you planning to just have the academics, let's say lab technicians do the experiments, are you going to have different groups of students in and kind of alternate them around so that they still get hands on? Yeah, we're going to be having different groups of learners uh, mm. doing it. Uh, they're going to be scheduled. So obviously there's a rotation going through. Uh, so there's not a lot of people on at one time. Uh, the, the blended learning sessions are going to be available twice that week live and obviously to watch on repeat as many times as you want. So hopefully by the end of the year, everybody's had a go at doing the practical experiment themselves, but they've always got the uh, blended learning recorded videos or live sessions to refer back to. Right. So you, are you, you mentioned yesterday you were using Microsoft Teams. To, yeah. And you're going to be live streaming like we are today with the web camera and the equipment in the background. And exactly this. Yeah, it's going to be the exact same, exact same scenario as what we have now. Uh, we're going to have a, the camera set up in the classroom and the, and the workshop and the labs doing the, recording the live demonstrations and, uh, you know, showing that through Microsoft Teams to as many learners as they want to log on. And the, the benefit we've had from this as well is that sometimes you get people who are doing a different type of course, uh, the college, and they think, well, I might know if they're doing motor vehicle level three or an engineering level two, then they might want to see what's coming if they went to go and do an engineering course. I would about to see what they might be doing next year for it to progress onto an H and C. Then they've got access to all this remote learning, these virtual sessions and these live sessions. So, you know, it's a brilliant advertisement to learners for progression. It's also excellent revision for learners when it comes to doing the assignments that they're doing. Um, yeah, and it gives people from other types of edu other types of qualifications like motor vehicle always carpentry or brick lane or whatever you want, just to see what it's like in another industry. So that we can, you know, in the future, if you ever considered switching or it gives them options. I think yeah. that I really hadn't thought of that. I think that's fantastic. The point about revision as well. I've had some yeah. questions here. Um, how many students do you consider in each group in the lab? Now you're lucky because you've got big labs, haven't you? Yeah, we've got a decent space. At the moment, um, in the one lab that we've got set up, we're looking at five, we've got five learners with electricity, so about six people at the moment. So if you've got a group of 20, that's obviously going to be four sessions of each one of them wanted to go on at any one time, you know, uh, rotating them. Uh, but obviously, yeah, there's a live recordings and, the, 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 you know, the virtual learning if you wanted it. It's dependent on your room size. It goes off your room size, the equipment and the type of task, um, you know, and it's done, that's done through the risk, risk assessments that the estate's manager does. 
and the health and safety person. Yeah. Thanks, Oliver. Mm. Um, I think and we've got some nice feedback there from people who've just listened to your responses about blended learning. Um, and one individual would perhaps like to get in touch. Um, would So it may be that we share your contact details after this. Not a, session, not a problem. Because you really have got some amazing experience. If you do want a bit more about that, Oliver was talking about this in our live Q&A session yesterday, how they've set up the infrastructure at Traf Trafford College to allow for social distancing. So, so uh, I would suggest you pop over and watch that after uh, perhaps you've joined this live session today. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, so back to you, Dave. You're taking. Okay. But, well, let's, I think now we're going to be talking yeah. about engine cycle analysis. Yeah. Just before I do that, Oliver, if if you need any um, support on the state of your equipment, it's seven years since I came to Trafford College and installed. Really? If you've got, if you've got any questions about anything in particular in front of you. Um, let me know, okay? Yeah, um, brilliant, Dave. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, you know, I can maybe well. give you some support by this platform. Just, um, just yeah, excellent idea. Yeah, that's just brilliant. To help you anyway, you know. Yeah. Okay, thank you so, very much. Uh, yeah, let's look at the engine cycle analysis. Now, you remember last week, Dion? I went to into a little bit more detail on the environmental control. So I spoke about pressure, enthalpy, etc. Well, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about the ECA 100. Um, this is a bit of hardware and software that measures the internal combustion engine cylinder pressure and the crank angle, okay? So it, it has automatic calculation. It's a real-time display of PQ and PV charts and other important parameters. You can get snapshots, you can replay it, and you have animated functions as well. Now we can export the data for further analysis, okay? Now, if we go to the next slide, there's something very interesting that the ECA can highlight, and that's what's known as ignition delay, which is what we see on, on diesel engines, okay? So you can see on that chart there, on the left-hand part of the graph, you see a little kink in the rising edge and that indicates a, the start of the injection and the, the start of the combustion. Now, diesel engine manufacturers, manufacturers have spent billions of pounds trying to reduce this, this time, okay? So this ignition delay, all right, it causes an increase in temperature inside your engine, engine chamber of your diesel engine, um, and it can cause the pressure to increase, and it does lead to undesirable auto ignition, uh, and that results in no a knocking phenomenon. Okay, that can eventually cause a failure in the piston, in the piston walls, and in the piston rings. Okay, so this delayed ignition is the primary cause of increased emissions and inferior engine performance. Okay. Now, to reduce this, we, we use an additive, not we, but the manufacturers of the fuel, they, they actually use an additive, and it's called cetane, C-E-T-A-N-E. -E. And it's a colorless gas, okay, which ignites easily when exposed to a small amount of heat. And we give it a cetane number. So the cetane number is a measurement of the combustion quality of the diesel, okay? during the compression, um, it, compression ignition. So the lower the cetane number, the longer the ignition delay. So fuels with a high cetane number, they burn more quickly and more completely, resulting in a smoother running engine with less uh, power lag, reduced emissions and easier engine starting. So that's what that little kink is on that graph. And we can actually see that on our ECA 100 hardware and software. So that's why, why it's just one of the benefits of op offering this, this um, piece of kit. Now, Oliver, have you, have you come across, well, you must have come across and been exposed to this because every lab I've been to, there is a graph on the wall with this, with this um, anomaly, if you like, on, on the, and, yeah, tra tradi traditionally referred to in the motor vehicle industry as engine knock. Yeah. Um, you know, which yeah, we had a, you know, always a problem with 
I remember in, uh, when you get this, going back to the 90s now when everybody were yeah. turning the boost up on turbocharged cars, yeah. Right? Yeah. bleeding off vacuum to the actuators, and you'd end up with a longer fuel ratio and end up with a, an engine knock. That's it. Um, you know, and then obviously then we started bringing out the uh, high octane number fuels, uh, the super unleaded, which got which helped with the engine knock issues running yeah. running high boost. So yeah, that graph in front is uh, rather familiar. Uh, and, yeah, you know, and the beauty of it is we we can actually observe that live on our on our screen. We get a live. Um, we it it it, it calculates. It measures, um, we can record um, as, as that's happening. So we can see it live, which is really, yeah. really exciting. If you can see it happening live, it's that you can put things in place to prevent it yeah. from happening, yeah. can't you? Where if you're, you're, if you're tuning an engine and you, have, or you can't watch that, gra that, fit, that graph appear, then you're going yeah. to have issues just by trying to listen for knock or measure glass temperatures. Yeah. I know I talk about diesel, but in my time, I, I would just turn my distributor about a few degrees. Just, to, just well, to... that's basically what the engine management light does, do it? But you know, back in the yeah. the exhaust timing so much with the knock give, give it a little twist, a little twist. Yeah, you end up with no power. Oh, you... <laughs> <laughs> but that's basically what it was a balance of ignition timing and a fuel yeah, yeah. ratio to, a, to try and eradicate the knock years yeah, ago. Yeah. But like I say, years yeah. ago, that's what we used to do. We used to, you know, you alter your distributor timing and alter your uh, fuel ratio. But, you know, yeah. but now there's so many systems in place that do that automatically. Uh, once one of them parameters changes, it doesn't know what to do. No. So this no. is why you need, uh, why, why I keep saying about this skills gap, where you can, uh, you need to be more than just putting parts on, take apart, soft type of person. You need to be able to understand multiple systems and thermodynamics and yeah. advanced uh, advanced uh, engine readings. And what do we actually mean? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. That is a cracking piece of, piece of equipment that does that. Yeah. Oliver, we've had a question now, and it, it harks back to the discussion that we were having to yesterday about, is this the best time for students to continue with their studies and career progression? Now, I know your answer, but you just tell us what your response is to that. Yeah. I'll reiterate what I said yesterday. It's uh, the only in the past, the only re people took a gap year out. Why do you take a gap year out of education? Usually it was, I want some get experience and cultural diversity and go and fly around the world and see different countries. Or it was, I'm going to I'll get a job somewhere and earn a bit of money. Or hopefully I'll get into a, a career job that helps with my education. A lot of them things are restricted right now, uh, you know, and... You know, financially, it's a big commitment to take a year off and flying about. But the big issue we have right now is don't waste a year doing nothing at the moment <clears> or just <throat> doing something because of the fun of it. We need, please, our education can be fun and it's vital to your, everybody's futures. You know, there's going to be so many, there's, so, there's going to be jobs coming out of this. We need to have that type of education and experience. Use the use your time very wisely. A year is a long time to take out of your life to go and do something that isn't going to reward you long term. Let's get get on with education. Let's get back into education and have something to focus on. Because like I said, at the moment there's a lot of negativity every time you turn on to the every time you turn the TV on, and it is like it's like the world's best disaster film. You know the news channel is. You're watching that and it's just bad news after bad news after bad news. That's not meaning that we need to not pay any attention to the problems we have at the moment. But don't think everything can just stop while we start. So when you can be getting on with a quality ed education, emphasise on the word quality. That's why myself, colleagues and other colleagues are working really hard to make sure it's blended learning packages you know, available to all learners so we can get that quality education going forward to better themselves, better their lives. Thank you, Oliver. That's brilliant. That's uh, a very, very clear message. For yeah, very positive. Who might be hesitating right now, might be thinking about, is it going to be a compromised experience? When actually, it sounds like it really is not going to be a compromised education experience. In fact, if you listen to Oliver yesterday, he talks about how it's, in fact, an enhanced education experience is going to come out of this. Yeah, of course, yeah, it's, it is. I wish I had, I wish I, 
I wish I had the blended learning that's available now back when I was studying. You know, I wish I had. <laughs> and I think all this has happened, one of the silver lines of tech code, it's pushed everybody into moving forward with virtual and blended learning, but is it has been needed. So yeah, the people who've got put the work in are, pro are providing it now to any learners that need it. Absolutely. Great. So over to you, Dave. We, we're not just about internal combustion engines. Right? No. It's really, your no. passion, your gas turbines. What Let's are your favourite products so, coming up shortly? Yeah, here we have the uh, Tech Equipment GT100 Turbojet Trainer. Um, and this piece of kit allows detailed experiments on, on, on how a single shaft gas turbojet works and we can test its performance, okay? So basically, just to, in layman's terms, we have ambient air, it passes into an air box, from there into a compressor, into a combustion chamber, um, a pump transfers fuel from the fuel tank through a spray, so, so, so through a special nozzle into the combustion chamber. Then we have a high energy spark plug. This ignites that air fuel mixture. And then this flows to uh, a radial flow turbine and a variable area uh, nozzle at the back of the GT100, GT okay? Um, we have a fuel flow control valve on the instrumentation control panel so we can regulate the speed. Um, we can look at the isentropic, the polytropic, and mechanical efficiencies of the compressor, um, the combustion chamber, and the turbine. And um, we can look at the specific fuel consumption and the thermal efficiency. So this is this is real life. Okay, it's using kerosene or Jet A1 as uh, as its fuel, which is the the standard for jet aircraft. We don't use we don't use propane, which is inherently dangerous. And this this turbine this actually spins up uh, up to a hundred thousand RPM, which is what one thousand six hundred and sixty six RPM uh, revs per second. So it's real life. It's really really dynamic and extremely interesting piece of kit to to run. Great, thanks for that, Dave. Uh, let's have a look at the next one now. Once we've skipped through this, it's the uh, the one with the reheat. The afterburner, yeah. So this is a, a separate control panel that really adjusts the amount of fuel to the reheat section or the exhaust section, okay? So we have a, we have a second high energy spark or spark plug in the reheat section or in the exhaust. Um, this ignites the reheat fuel that's, that's sprayed into the exhaust. And this creates a secondary burn, a, a secondary uh, thrust or afterburn, as we as we know it. Um, it. And it's using some of the leftover oxygen in the hot exhaust gases, leaving the turbine to ignite. So we may all, we may have a bit of um, footage here of some of it breathing some fire or not. Um, I'm hoping we've got some fire <laughs> breathing going on. I'm trying to skip to the fire breathing point. That's yeah. not that's not you. I meant I meant the gas turbine, not not, <laughs> not me at the moment. Anyway, let's just... somebody's in somebody's in trouble now, Oliver. I try oh. and... <laughs> when we've finished on this webinar, Dave, we'll have a word. <laughs> I, 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 I can only be the one to breathe fire right now because there isn't any fire in this session. I'm all very oh, okay. Okay, by the looks of it in this web in this particular video, so we'll have to uh, imagine the fire for that one. Not to worry. We'll go, on to, the next one. we'll go on to the next um, Let's have a look. Uh, the next gas turbine, which is the GT185, I believe. There we go. Indeed it Wait is. For it. There it's we go. There we go. So this is this is a similar piece of kit to the GT100, similar sort of platform. Again, it's self-contained, fully instrumentated, um, educational. And it's a two shaft gas turbine, again, powered by kerosene, okay? So it looks into the, the characteristics and practical investigations uh, and performance of a two shaft gas turbine. So on the GT100, the hot gases exhaust, they go, to, they go to the atmosphere. But on this one, the hot gas from that turbine actually passes through a very short duct it's short because we want to keep the losses of heat to a minimum. And it then powers a second 
uh, a second turbine, or also known as the power turbine. Okay. Um, now this power turbine, it's coupled directly to an eddy current dynamometer, so there are no belts to adjust, and a load cell on that dyno allows us to look at the the true shaft power of that turbine, and we can adjust the load on both the turbines and the dynamometer and the dynamometer. Therefore, we, we can actually adjust the speed of that second power turbine. Now there's a good screenshot there of the, of the data acquisition, looking at all the different parameters that can be gathered and saved. Great, well, that's it for us on the products. Um, now we want to focus a little bit on some of the case studies. Dave, uh, we showed a video earlier of the University of Derby, uh, one of uh, yeah. In the test set, but we also have another video here, which is the University of Derby again using a gas turbine now. Oh, I sort the volume out. <laughs> there we go. We can mute that. We don't need that interference. Um, but the University of Derby, they have a range of different teaching elements, whether it's the huge uh, temperature flume, the engine test set with various different yeah. engines. Um, yeah. And of course, the GT100 turbojet here. Yeah, that's a very, very good video. And that's a good install. They have the GT100. They don't have the reheat on their gas turbine, just the regular GT100. I will show it properly now. It's, uh, I'll be breathing fire in a minute because it's not playing more. <laughs> yeah. There we go. We can see the actual students getting hands on with that piece of apparatus with the laptop. There we go. There we go. And you can see there, there's a, there's a good mimic panel on the front so we can follow the process from left where the air is sucked in through the, through the air box chamber into, into the combustion chamber. Pressure gauges everywhere, temperature gauges, looking at the, the, the temperatures. Those temperatures, Oliver, get up to about 500 degrees Celsius on the exhaust and up to about 600 with reheat. So it's real life. And you can imagine the, imagine the noise it makes. It's beautiful. <laughs> well, it's, it's a matter of perspective. For me, it's very loud, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, then there's also Birmingham City University. Birmingham City have an amazing facility right in the center of Birmingham. They do. Um, and they have a wide range of different engineering teaching uh, products that cover different courses that they offer there. One of them, they do cover a, an automotive course and they do use um, various pieces of tech equipment um, apparatus in there, including the engines in, in their particular labs. I'm not sure whether this particular video shows all the engines in detail. Um, but you can watch through these case studies at your own leisure from the Tech Equipment website or from the YouTube channel itself. Yeah. Uh, they, have, they, have a, they have a bit of everything there. I mean, I've installed aerodynamics, thermodynamics, fluid, fluid mechanics. And just in the autumn, I was there to install their engine, their, their TD200 engine in the basement. So, yeah, they have a good selection. We've got yeah. a similar selection of equipment that we have. Um, really? Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love one of the engines as well, though. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. That's, yeah, their, that's their very engine they have there. Looks like a, looks like a petrol engine. Yeah. Great. Okay. So um, I have one more question. Another question for Oliver now. Um, the question is, how is Industry 4.0 revolution changing the teaching methods? And is it creating the need of new equipment in the lab? And this is something that, um, an, an interesting topic that's been going around for a couple of years. Uh, yeah. What's your perspective on that at the moment? We've had a lot of requirements uh, to introduce Industry 4.0 to our curriculum, uh, mainly from companies such as Bentley. Um, mm -hmm. They wanted it to be a primary, one of the units that was delivered. Uh, also, some a lot of companies in the aeronautical industries ask for it as well. Um, yes, there is going to be some equipment that needs to be acquired for that teaching. How are we going to incorporate it into that actual, the actual situation that we have right now is yet to be determined. We introducing Industry 4.0 will be taught from to traffic from January. 
on our January intake classes. Right. Okay. Well, we'll be watching this space, and uh, we'll uh, we'll have to check back with you to what yeah. you're doing there with that. Fantastic. Okay. Good. So keep your questions coming. Some really good questions here. Uh, now we've finished looking at the case studies, um, and we finish looking at engines in general. I'm going to give Oliver and Dave a bit of a quick, a quick break. Well, I talk a little bit more okay. about remote learning support. Uh, we've already had the questions about COVID-19, we talked about blended learning. Um, and at the moment, we at Tech Equipment have been working very hard to support you in every way we can, whether that's bringing you together in communities, on Facebook and LinkedIn and YouTube. They are there, people perhaps aren't utilizing them uh, to the extent that they could be, but I would encourage you to go and check out the practical teaching and engineering education communities or go on the community cab on YouTube on the Tech Equipment page. We've also got an area on the Tech Equipment uh, website called techquipment.com remote learning support. We've got some, uh, we've got PDF there, reference videos that um, can be supportive to your online learning experience. They're not necessarily tech equipment videos. There might be in uh, videos from practical engineering or other channels that provide insight on it, whether it's civil engineering, whether it's fluid mechanics or a strength of materials, uh, whether it might be real life examples looking at bridges or different structures or different coastal um, occurrences. I would encourage you to go and check those out. We've got lots of student experiment videos as well, courtesy of our student competition that we've been running with Nottingham Trent University. It's part of um, uh, the deliverable on that competition is to create a video, a lab experiment video. So this is another good complementary uh, asset for your blended learning digital experience. If you're wanting to show students how to use pieces of equipment, again, good for revision, actually. Um, you can look at what students are doing there. You see them operating pieces of equipment. They're referencing theory in that. It's a really nice uh, resource. At the moment, we're chucking about one video out a week of different students using the pieces of equipment. Last week, one team were looking at the shape of bullet tips in long range firearms and what would be the most efficient understanding the aerodynamic um, effects. Other teams have look, been looking at spoiler di uh, designs on race cars or helmet designs in, uh, for the Tour de France, for example. So using real life applications um, to understand a topic and test it practically with a video. I would, I would definitely recommend you have a look at those. We're, if you are thinking about creating lab experiment videos that you can have as part of your resources available for students to access digitally, we've created a little tips video there uh, that you can have a look at that will advise you on lighting, etc. I would also encourage you to go back and check back at last week's Q&A live. We had a uh, post-production and video production uh, specialist with us. We were talking with Andrew last week, who was our specialist online, um, about how best to approach creating lab experiments videos. He was really recommending phones are really powerful. Uh, you can do a pretty good job. But you need to think about the editing tool, how much time you've got to put into it. Are you going to think about outsourcing your editing, for example? Are you going to learn that skill set yourself? Have you got the time? If you have got the time, great, because you get another skill set to build into uh, what you can offer. We do deliver the live Q and A's. We had Oliver last week for the this week rather yesterday. Uh, and we, we have a guest every week talking about whether it may be um, why you should carry on with your education like Oliver, uh, why uh, tips for creating videos, how to cope in COVID-19, uh, what it's like to be a woman in engineering in Lebanon, for example. We had Dima Nasser a couple of months ago talking about that. Uh, we had the Dean of Teddy London, a new university that's setting up, which is all about project-based learning. So lots of Great value there, um, insight that you can gain during this time. Now that's it for me talking about remote learning support. Now Dave is going to uh, finish eating his pickled egg. No, 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 no pickled egg today. Just a trusty can of uh, Pepsi Max. All oh, right, okay. Oh, you do disappoint. <laughs> I was wondering what was for lunch. Uh, no lunch today. Oh, 
the weather's brought a famine to your house. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I've got I've got enough spare timber to last till till dinner time. Oh, what a relief! <laughs> well, uh, as you've still got the energy, perhaps you can tell us more about all the other ranges that we offer. So all that right, those well, who don't know, your, your, your brand new mouse and cursor is hovering over engineering science. So this, this is a range of eighteen modular experiments. Okay, covering subject matters such as moments. We have friction, uh, cams, we can look at tensile. All, all these experiments sit on a, a work panel, depending on the configuration, depends on whether you go for portrait or landscape. And those work panels you can see on the left-hand side of that slide and on the right-hand side is there. So it's a very good introduction to mechanical engineering and it's proven to be a very popular um, range and I think you've got some of them in, in Telford, um, Oliver. I'm yeah, Str uh, Stratford. <laughs> yeah, Str Stratford. Stratford Campus, the STEM yeah. building. Yeah, that's the setup that we've got there. Yeah, in our materials lab. Uh, excellent piece yeah. of equipment. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. I remember doing some training on those back in back a few years ago now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant piece of equipment. So, fluid mechanics. Well. Uh, this is this is an extensive range of high quality fluid mechanics teaching and lab equipment. Uh, we as a company, TechWoom, were the first to offer a modular range of equipment for the fundamental studies of fluid mechanics. Um, th these are practical experiments um, available for nearly all of fluid mechanics courses. So it covers flumes, viscosity, flow measurement, all types of fluid mechanics. Engines, well, I think we've spoken about engines enough today. Control engineering, okay, so this offers fundamental to advanced investigations into control principles uh, using actual applications found in industry, found in the real world, okay. For example, stability control of an aircraft, and even ships. And all of our CE range or control engineering includes our specialist CE2000 software. And this can also be used for simulated control of, of different experiments. And this leads us quite nicely onto process control. This again looks at the fundamental to advanced studies into real life processes. So this can be PID, DCS, cascading controls of pressure, flow, level, and temperature. Again, we have this dedicated software that's been developed by TQ to cover this process range. Then you've selected electrical power, something completely different. Uh, the electrical power systems range provides advanced technical uh, teaching and training equipment for all elements of power systems okay so that can include generation transformation transmission distribution and utilization and protection so these scalable products provide a good hands-on learning with the options of hardware and software additions for example a second generator and a SCADA system we have the main pss1 but we, uh, system but we can also offer modular pieces of equipment from the PSL 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50. Their materials, uh, which we spoke about yesterday, one of my favorite ranges where we get to break things. Uh, we are looking into the properties of material testing, uh, which is fundamental um, to any engineering courses, okay? Uh, this is a completely comprehensive range covering subject matters, matters such as tension, compression, impact, and hardness testing, as well as stress, strain, um, and, and, and structural analysis, okay? Environmental control, well, this was a good subject last week. Uh, this is our HVAC range covering simple refrigeration cycle units and um, air conditioning units. So that was that was um, spoken about last week. Um, it covers fundamental theories associated with thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, and heat transfer. So our environmental control, we're, look, we're, we're looking at cooling, 
refrigeration, AC and humidity. And thermodynamics, again, we, we have spoken in depth a few weeks ago, I think, Dion. This is small scale uh, equipment for experiments into the laws of thermodynamics. So it includes real working systems using industrial components and assemblies. Um, so, yeah. And structures. This is our range of uh, 19 or so modular structures experiments. Again, we are market leaders in structures, uh, include static fundamentals, uh, structures experiments. The hardware can be used as standalone or with the str 2000 can be used for data acquisition or virtual experiments, actual classroom demonstrations on a whiteboard. And the software can be standalone or it can be networked as well. Yeah, it's the type of uh, setup that we run as well at, at Stratford. Yeah. That I yeah, got about so used throughout, throughout the, uh, the entirety of the year and will be used a lot with the blended learning models that we're running due to the simulation aspects as well. You know, so we can give um, them the ability to do the simulations as well as run the live. It's so very powerful, isn't it? Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, and it, you know, it's. Uh, Similar type, being able to run simulations is absolutely vital. Uh, yeah. The gentleman alluded to the uh, Industry 4.0 that was asked before. You know, there's a lot of simulation that's involved within that for lean manufacturing. Yeah. Uh, Do you have it so, networked, Oliver? Is it networked on your system? Not as yet, but it will be by September. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fingers, <laughs> Fingers yeah. crossed. We're on with it right now. I'm saying September at the very latest, but I'm hoping it's going to be in the next few weeks. Yeah, well, I can I can give you some remote support if you if you need that. You know, when you come to do that in store. Ah, oh, brilliant! Yeah, I will be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And VDAS. Well, I'm not going to talk too much about VDAS. Tell us why, Dion. No, I, I would stop you because you're only allowed to tease the audience because next week we are back to talk about VDAS and this is a particularly okay. interesting topic as, as we've highlighted with Oliver how they're planning to use VDAS in labs yeah. uh, to, so they can do the lab sessions and then you can uh, broadcast the VDAS data live. Uh, we will be back for the webinar next week and hopefully we should be uh, running some experiments live and getting out the live data as um, you know the likes of Oliver and his lab technicians and students will be doing in their labs yeah. we'll have to see what we can set up from our yeah. offices for that so do join us next week at the same time for the VDAS webinar um, okay. but we do we do have a few more little ranges to cover one of those is solar Dave I know we covered it oh last solar week. Yeah, th th we spoke about solar last week. Uh, Not that it would be any good today for no, us. No, <laughs> no. Any in Turkey. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, we, we're looking at hydrology today, I think, outside. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Th uh, the rainfall apparatus, I would recommend. Oh, you don't, calm down, calm down, Dion. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, carry on. Do tell us about solar. Wow, OK. Well, th this range offers teaching equipment for the core principles of solar energy. All right. So we're looking at uh, PV cells or photovoltaic cells. In other words, we have a flat plate um, solar thermal collector. We have focusing solar energy collectors so students can learn about the efficiencies and the limitations of solar power, whether they're generating electricity, converting it from AC to DC, which you see on the top right there, or using solar radiation to heat water, which is what you see on the roof panels on some houses, and that's in the centre. And then we have a, a solar collector on the left hand side. So it's it's seasonal. Seasonal work is solar. <laughs> Right. All right. Thank you very much, Dave. But before we go, we've got one of your favourite topics. Uh, yeah. Talking uh, is aerodynamics and this wonderful lab that you love. Yeah. Every every um, subject area is started with oh, one of your favourite topics. You've not asked me, and I don't think you should <laughs> ask me what my least favourite topic is. So maybe we'll just skip that unless unless somebody asks it on the on the on the search on the, on the on the text box we won't we won't answer that dear no no let's not go there i know what it is and i'm not saying it <laughs> yeah, okay <laughs> well that moves us on nicely to um, aerodynamics and that picture was actually taken in a tornado shelter okay in alabama 
last November or maybe September. Anyway, last autumn anyway. So there we have three subsonic wind tunnels all facing us in anger near the inlet cones that we see there. So a good introduction to aerodynamics, looking at lift, drag, pitching moment, uh, flow visualization using smoke generators, balances to measure um, the effects of stalling and flow separation. So a, a wonderful pitch we have there. Moving on to supersonic wind tunnels, we can do a continuous Mach 1.8 wind tunnel, either intermittent or continuous. So the, the, the user would decide on, on the choice there, depending on budget and available space. Brilliant. Uh, for more information on the aerodynamics range, we've got loads of resources. We've got the a live event that we held last year in the Tech Equipment Factory, where we've got all the different uh, wind tunnels being demonstrated and explanations from Dave. We also did a webinar on this about a month ago, so you can have a look at that as well. Yeah, we did. Oliver, you must, you need a wind tunnel in Telford. Come on. I do. You need a wind. <laughs> I do. I've just, I've just, I've been uh, while I'm doing this, I'm writing my shopping list. <laughs> Good work. So, so if uh, you know the vice principal's watching, yeah. <laughs> you, you need a subsonic wind tunnel to measure the drag of all those wing mirrors and aerofoils and and spoilers you've got in your lab there. Exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> nice sales pitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mm. Oh, uh, yeah. And one more. Yeah. Theory machine. So just in that gearbox there, we can look at uh, vibrations. We can look at gears. We can look at whirling of shafts. So uh, again, a real hands on range looking at all aspects of machines, whether it be centrifugal force, it could be gyroscopes, all those subjects within theory machines. Brilliant. That's it for the ranges. But do not go, everybody, because this is your chance to summon up all those questions that sat in the back of your mind and ask them to Dave and Oliver. However challenging these questions might be, uh, they are very much up for lively debate as we saw, <laughs> or discussion, not debate. There was no debate. <laughs> Um, as we saw in the Q&A live yesterday. So while you're thinking, uh, I'm just going to again talk about some of the things that we've got on offer to help support the community. The student competition I'd like to mention. Uh, Tech Equipment offers a student competition where we work locally with the university and college. You can do a competition within your course as an extracurricular activity. Um, and then the winners of those competitions can go through to an international competition. You can watch the, all the entrance from uh, Nottingham Trent University in a video that was released last week. We had 16 different teams in there. This is a great way of getting the students engaged. Um, it's also a good way of getting them to achieve their communications objectives. There's one thing, writing reports, but to create a video, more and more of us, as we all know from the COVID-19 situation, we're having to get used to these presentation capabilities. As an engineer, you need to be able to put your case forward as well. Um, so these communication skills are very important and creating these videos is a very, very helpful in building up that skill set. And so... If you want to talk to us about that, contact me um, at marketing at techquipment.com and we can discuss how that might work for you. Uh, there's the video. I'm going to skip over that because you can watch that at a later date. You may also want to look at a survey that we did in 2019 that looked at the perceptions of practical teaching in engineering education. Um, if you're looking at justifying expenditure, for example, Oliver might want his wind tunnel and he's trying to justify it to his principal mm -hmm. and he's trying to get more statistics that will back him up to get those tens of thousands of pounds that he might need. Then it may well be that having st st some statistics will help him if I can say the word statistics today. The key statistic that I'd like to talk about today from this study was <laughs> that 90% of academics believe that practical learning is extremely important for student employability. And that's going to be really important to remember during COVID-19 as we try and achieve blended learning, um, that we need to keep that in mind, keep in mind how important it is for students. 
for all of these findings, there's more interesting statistics in that report that you can find on our website. Now, this is the point where you can ask any other questions to our team with us today. I have a question, Dave, and that's about the engine test bed. So we've got two. Okay. We've got the, I like to call it the basic one. It's not basic at all, but it, it, it's, no. it's the most basic one that we offer. And then yeah. we've got the regenerative, regenerative engine test, uh, which has a yeah. lot more inbuilt functionality in there. Yeah. There's yeah. those engines that plug onto them. Yeah. How easy is it to swap out an engine? Is that something you leave to a student to do? Can you do it in one lab session and go, right, okay, oh, get on with the diesel yes, engine, get yeah. on with the petrol engine? Yeah, definitely, definitely. It, it's a two-person job, though, Dion, although it's saying that I know how to do it on my own because, you know, just by the nature of my job, I work alone for 90% of the time. But the diesel engines are inherently heavier than the than the petrol engines but they're just bolted with four m12 bolts on the engine test bed and then you have a spider rubber coupler joining it to the dyno so that just literally separates like this okay uh, then you would have to unhook the air pipe because we measure the air consumption we have a big air pipe going into into the carburetor or the injector mechanism and then you need to unplug your exhaust setup configuration and finally the thermocouples because we measure the the exhaust temperature and the ambient temperature but then it's just a case of lifting it off carefully onto a trolley even onto the floor adjacent to the test bed out of the way so nobody trips up on it then fitting is just the opposite of removal, lift it into place, make sure that that spider coupler mates as it should, fit the exhaust, fit the air pipe, do those bolts up tight because we don't want it rattling off the dyno and then you're good to go. So the whole process, maybe 15 to 20 minutes, okay. which will improve. It will improve with, with experience. Yeah. Right, brilliant, very comprehensive answer. Now, Dave, we were talking about the gas turbines and you like listening to the noise. And we saw people with their earmuffs in and earplugs in. How loud are we talking here? Have we got noise issues? Or? Yeah, there, there are there are noise considerations. Uh, in the manual, we've, we've done a very comprehensive guide to the noise levels at the front of the unit, at the back where it's noisiest. And I seem to think uh, and Oliver will know more about the regulations, but it's over 75 decibels. So that then brings into brings into play the, the need for personal protective equipment with the, with your earmuffs and so on. I seem to think it's about 100 decibels maximum. So therefore, students and technicians and lecturers would have to take precautions um, for this. Yeah, we might be some ins insulation involved around the building of which, which yeah. the you know the sits in because ultimately with that much that much sound, you, you, you when you leave, leaving the building like that, uh, yeah. it's got to be an insulated room really. What it's got to be in. Um, yeah. But uh, so yeah, speak could it speak about one thing? I just I've always thought about it when it comes to buying these pieces of equipment. If you was to try and. Um, budget that for a motor vehicle department or even an engineering department um you would always get some well why do we need to spend so much on one piece of equipment like that what cost does it reflect to um mm -hmm. and in education sometimes in colleges we do cap uh, you know we do uh, make sure that it's the engineering budget and a motor vehicle budget or a science budget uh, but pieces of equipment can be used over multiple departments you know and it's down to uh being creative timetabling to get the efficiency out of holding them, holding them pieces of equipment and making sure that we're getting used and we're not the yeah. redundant for 90% of the time. There's no need for them to be. Multiple departments can use them pieces of equipment. So you've got a wider market, a wider, wider budgeting uh, system that can put into buying it. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's a really good point. So, you know, if, what, if an academic from one department is wanting to buy a piece of equipment and it doesn't quite fit within the budget, um, really do encourage collaboration within, yeah. within your different departments. Uh, I mean, you should be doing that and you want to be doing that anyway. It's not necessarily yeah. about how much money you've got available. You want to utilize what you've got at your disposal 
max to the maximum so that you can do the best for everybody um, both for your university and college and your students so a good point for everybody to consider sometimes we forget these things so busy mm. yeah. along it goes right down it goes right down to you know there's always been this cap uh, you know we tend to put engineering staff or uh, motor vehicle staff or science so there's a lot of good shared skill sets within within subjects now uh, especially with the implementation of hybrid tech, hybrid systems into motor vehicle you know you've got thermodynamics that work over multiple departments uh, science engineering and motor vehicle so you've got staff who are in specialisms don't just have engineering staff doing engineering motor vehicle doing motor vehicle maximize your efficiencies if you want to save money which is what it's all about these days isn't it unfortunately yeah <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, gentlemen. At the moment, I haven't got any more questions. I will remind you about everybody who's watching this live. Use your chat box right now. Do put your questions in there before we finish this webinar up. If you do think of them afterwards, we're all human, then do feel free to put them in the comment box of the main video. This will be available on demand, so you can share the link. You can watch it, re-watch it back 10 times if you want, at your own leisure. Um, and you can put your comments in that comment box and we will come back to you. That brings me to our very end now, which is reminding you that next week we're talking about VDAS. That is the Versatile Data Acquisition System. And this is the both the hardware and the software system that allows us to collect data, capture data, chart data, um, do extensive analysis with many, many pieces of equipment. In some cases, this is a requirement of the equipment to be able to get the data. In some cases, it's an optional. But join us then when I'll be back with Dave. We'll hopefully have some live equipment running uh, so that we could show you how, the, how it all works, uh, how easy it is. So yes, join us next week on the 25th of June at one o'clock British Standard Time on YouTube. I'd suggest if you've got a YouTube account, you click the reminder bell and it will bing up 30 minutes before and remind you that we are about to go live. So gentlemen, thank you so much for being part of this webinar today. Yeah, thanks Dion, and thanks um, Oliver. And Oliver, like I said, if you need any remote support in the coming weeks, you know how to get hold of us, okay? Yeah, cheers, Dave. Thanks a lot. Um, You're welcome. Yeah, really enjoyed, really enjoyed these last couple of days. Uh, yeah, I've good. learned something, and hopefully everybody else has learned something too. Yeah, and good luck with your your intake. Yeah, yeah, hope so. Things are looking good at the moment. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Oliver. Thank you, Dave, and thank you everybody for joining us and watching live and letting us know what your weather's like. Thanks, Dave. Thank you and goodbye. Bye-bye.